Hi, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today's topic is understanding and administering ERISA's Form 5500 filing requirements for health and welfare plans. Um, just so you know, today's session is going to be recorded and all the slides will be made available after today's recording. For anybody looking to receive credit through HRCI or through SHRM, we will be sharing the credit information uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, and anybody who has questions as we go along, feel free to enter them in the chat box and we will do our best to address them at the end of today's session. Today, I am joined by Caitlin Hillenbrand, who is an Associate Director for the Baldwin Regulatory Compliance Collaborative, and Jason Sheffield, who's the National Director of Compliance here at the Baldwin Regulatory Compliance Collaborative. Again, my name is Marie Smith. Here's the agenda of the items we're gonna be covering today. Uh, we're going to start in part one with what is a Form 5500 and why is it required? Part two, which employers and what plans must file a Form 5500? In part three, we will cover the deadlines surrounding the Form 5500 requirement. In part four, we will cover correcting Form 5500s, missed filings, and penalties. And then lastly, we will close with a question and answer session. As this is an educational program, there are some learning objectives that we need to make you aware of. Number one, understand the background of ERISA and Form 5500 filing requirements for health and welfare plans, including what they are, why they are filed, and how they are helpful to the DOL, as well as to plan participants. Number two, understand the obligations of plan administrators, administrators surrounding Form 5500 filing requirements including which employers and what plans are required to file Form 5500s and how many 5500s must be filed on behalf of an employer. Number three, understand and adhere to ERISA's Form 5500 filing deadline, as well as to learn any required participant disclosures and the appropriate way to make those disclosures. And number four, learn how to correct errors or omissions in previously filed Form 5500s as well as how to comply with the DOL's Delinquent Filer Voluntary Compliance Program. And number five, learn ERISA's potential penalties associated with an employer's failure to file its annual Form 5500 and or distribute the summary annual report to plan participants. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Caitlin. Great. So I'm going to get right in. Part one, what is a Form 5500 and why is it required? Okay, so before getting into 5500s, we have to discuss ERISA, which is where um, it's required from. So the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which stands for ERISA, was enacted into law in 1974. It outlines guidelines for administering employer-sponsored tax-advantaged retirement and health and welfare benefit plans, which we typically deal with the health and welfare benefit plan portion. Some of the obligations under ERISA are reporting requirements, which include this 5500 filing, Disclosure obligations, which include the summary annual report, which is essentially a shortened summary of that 5,500 that has to be provided to participants, and fiduciary guidelines. ERISA does not require employers to provide benefits. However, when employers choose to provide those benefits, there are standards for employers to voluntarily or to adopt that, that are um, voluntarily adopting those ERISA benefits. Exempt plans include government and church plans, plans maintained for state law. So this would include some things such as state mandated disability, plans maintained outside the US, um, ERISA applicability basics. Generally a plan, fund or program will be established for the purposes of ERISA if from the surrounding circumstances, a reasonable person can ascertain one, the intended benefits. So this would include you know, offering medical, dental, vision, a class of beneficiaries. So this would be who is eligible to receive those benefits. The source of financing, so whether this is self-funded, fully insured, um, provided through a trust, and the procedures for receiving benefits. Policy objectives for the Form 5500 filing requirement. So you kind of have three buckets here. You have the funding, which is the annual report of the plan's financial condition, investments, and operations designed for participants and beneficiaries. You have the compliance portion, so ERISA lays out these standards and it assists the DOL, IRS, Congress, and others with their enforcement and audit obligations in the event you are audited. You wanna make sure you are complying with these different various obligations. Disclosures, which acts as a means for communicating plan performance information to plan participants and beneficiaries to satisfy these ERISA disclosure obligations. So why is a Form 5500 required? 
So there's two kind of um, general categories here. It provides certain standards and certain information. So in terms of the standards, it assures employee benefit plans are maintained and administered in accordance with reasonable and prescribed standards. And then it ensures that employee benefit plan participants and beneficiaries are provided with or have access to in the event they um, request this from the plan, adequate plan information. ERISA requires most US-based employee benefit plans to file an annual form 5500. There's two general categories of these 5500s. You kind of have the um, 401k 5500 filings, as well as the employer-sponsored health and welfare plans. Now, I include a little um, note there that not all health and welfare plans are required to have these filings. Most small plans will not file, and, and small plan is defined as under 100 participants as of the first day of the plan year. Mechanics of Form 5500 Preparation and Submission. So the plan administrator, which is typically the employer, is responsible for filing this Form 5500, while TPAs and other service providers assist with the draft preparation or even sometimes the filing of the Form 5500, the responsibility and legal liability remains with the employer. This is why I always emphasize that employers should get back this draft, carefully check all the information, make sure that the Schedule A's information matches in the 5500, you know, bring up any errors that they see, or if they have any questions about, they may have something on file that's different from what the carrier provided. Form 5500s are submitted with the DOL the last day of the seventh month after the plan year ends. So an example of this would be a 1122 to 1231 22 plan would be filed by or before July 31st, 2023, unless an extension is requested. If an extension is requested, it's an extra two and a half months. Form 5500s must be electronically submitted via the government's EFAS submission system. And there's also iFile, which Jason will be discussing later in his slide. So there's multiple coverage types that can be in these 5500s. These are some of them, medical, dental, vision, life, the components under a cafeteria plan, funding sources at FSAs, HRAs, certain voluntary plans that do not fall under the ERISA self safe harbor, long-term care, disability, and employee assistance programs. So types of information disclosed on the Form 5500. The Form 5500 cons consists of the main first three pages, which is general basic information along with any relevant Schedule A's, which will include fully insured information, and Schedule C's if it so applies. Additional schedules may be included on these submissions, and this is discussed on the next slide. So starting with, you will have the plan year, plan number, effective date, and name. If you have a wrap document in place, all of this information can be pulled from that wrap document. The sponsor's name, phone number, address, business code, and EIN. We will get questions as to what is my business code? I've never heard of this. And essentially, the, the IRS provides instructions annually. All of the business codes are listed. You can look at the description and see what best applies to your business. The plan administrator's name, phone number, address, and EIN, and this is often the same as the plan sponsor. There's a box that you can check indicating that it's the same. Whether this is a first filing, a final filing, a short plan year filing, or an amended filing, and participant count. We'll continue with more information on the next slide. You also have the funding types and benefits included within the filing. A signature block for the person or entity submitting the filing. That's, again, I emphasize that you you should very carefully review these 5500s to make sure the information is correct before signing that is going to submission. Participating employer information, the number of Schedule A's included with the submission as well as the information contained within those Schedule A's, financial information relative to the plan, and the Form M1 compliance statement for MEWAS, which stands for Multiple Employer Welfare Arrangements. So here's a list of all the schedules that will be included with these 5500s. Really with health and welfare plans, we typically only deal with A and, and occasionally with Schedule Cs. So Schedule A is fully insured. Um, it's essentially fully insured plan information that the carrier will provide, and that is attached to the back of the Form 5500. Uh, Schedule Cs we typically do not include unless service provider fees are over 5,000 and these fees are paid through a trust. The rest really deal with retirement plan filings, so we're not going to discuss them today. How many form 5500s do I need to file? This is a very common question. Do I need to file for each separate benefit? So an individual form 5500 is required for each plan that meets the filing requirements. Again, you look at the first day of the plan year and see how many employees, past employees are on the plan as of that date. 
Employer uh, plan sponsors must review their governing documents and assess plan operations to ascertain whether health and welfare benefits are being provided under a single plan or a or separate uh, different plans. Absent clear documentation establishing that all benefits are ordered under a single wrap plan, individual filings are required. So that brings us to what is a wrap plan document. Employers may elect to wrap several benefits together into one document. It incorporates all group insurance policies and contracts, including medical, dental, vision, life, if you so choose, into a single plan document, and also inserts uh, typically excluding um, ERISA language that the carriers will not provide in those documents. This process is utilized to improve legal compliance and simplify plan administration. Part two, which employers and what plans must file a form 5500? Okay, so filing exemptions and defining large and small welfare plans. I did this a little before, but we'll go more in depth now. We discussed at the beginning that categorically exempted entities are government and church plans, plans maintained for state law, and plans maintained outside the U.S., so those will not file. Large welfare plans are plans that cover 100 plus participants as of the first day of the plan year. Participants are current and former employees and do not include spouses or dependents. A small welfare plan is under 100 as of the first day of the plan year. And then MIWAs will also file and they're covered by the annual form M1 filing requirement. What is an unfunded plan and what is a funded plan? Most welfare benefit plans covered under ERISA are unfunded. Unf unfunded plans are those where benefits are paid solely from general employer assets and not from employer assets in whole or in part. Participant contributions are plan assets under DOL regulations. A plan that uses a trust or separately maintained fund to hold plan assets is not an unfunded plan. What is a funded plan? Funded plans pay benefits from their own plan assets. In this instance, appropriate funds are set aside in a custodial or similar trust account, and that account must be solely maintained for the purpose of providing benefits and to defray reasonable expenses of the plan. Understanding the interplay of voluntary benefit offerings. So certain plans may fall under this voluntary, voluntary benefit plan safe harbor, um, but there are certain requirements that the employer must hit, and we'll review those now. So um, as, I, as I indicate, certain benefit programs may be exempt from many of ERISA's requirements, including the annual Form 5500 filing requirement. To preserve the ERISA exemptions, the employer must satisfy several specific requirements in administering these benefits. So number one, employees pay the full cost of coverage utilizing post-tax premium contributions, so not running through a cafeteria plan. Premium payments are collected by the employer and transferred to the vendor. The employer obligation is limited to the requirement to transfer premiums. The employer may not accept any consideration in connection with the benefit, and there may be no employer endorsement of such voluntary programs. This is the hardest one to satisfy. Um, some examples of that would include the employer selects the carrier or signs a contract with the carrier. Uh, the employer is involved in plan design. Um, the employer includes one of these plans in a wrap plan document, or um, the employer could assist in claims and appeals. All of these things would bring it out of the voluntary uh, safe harbor. And I always recommend to err on the side of ERISA status. So if there is a question, I would say to be careful and safe, I would put this, um, I would include it in the wrap document and also file on it. Hey, Caitlin, do you mind if I step in for a moment? Sure. So one thing also on this voluntary benefit offering thing, um, the courts have been very, very reluctant to uh, interpret this uh, narrowly. And so what um, when you talk about employer endorsement, that, that fifth prong of that analysis, we actually, there was a case where an employer um, listed their voluntary benefits alongside their core benefits in their benefit guide, and that was deemed to be endorsement of those benefits. So even in your benefit guide, you have to separate your core benefits from your voluntary benefits and indicate with a statement at the top or at the beginning of the section with your voluntary benefits that these are voluntary benefit programs and that you don't receive consideration and that they're just a, a, a benefit of employment. So keep that in mind. There, there's, there's a very particular standards. Uh, and then discussing control group filings. So we also get this question a lot. There's, um, we're part of a control group. There's a parent, subsidiaries, all different EINs. Do we each have to file? 
So for plan sponsors that are part of a control group, typically only one form 5500 is required for each employee benefit plan maintained by the control group. In other words, member organizations within a control group generally prepare and submit a consolidated form 5500 filing. Also, you have to consider whether there is a wrap document in place or whether each of these benefits will have their own individual filing. Careful consideration must be given to whether funds contributed by the control group members are available to provide benefits to all eligible employees of that control group or whether they're siphoned off for one particular group. So um, this is a legal determination. We would not determine whether you have a control group in place. Uh, you would get an attorney involved in this. And then the assistance comes with um, how you would file and how your, how your benefits are um, in terms of funds and contributions maintained and provided. Okay, this is um, Jason's slide now. Hi, thank you, Caitlin. I appreciate it. Thanks for that introduction. So I'm going to start in part three with what are the deadlines surrounding the Form 5500 filing requirement? So the general deadline for the Form 5500, it, there's actually a couple of components, so we broke it down. So the Form 5500 generally must be submitted for filing on or before. Uh, the first prong is the last day of the calendar month, and then that's the calendar month occurring during the seventh month of the year, and that would be the seventh month of the year following the end of the reporting year. For example, the prior, the prior plan year. And then the caveat there is unless an exemption, a extension applies. So if you file your extension, then that would move the date forward uh, for your, um, your submission deadline. For calendar year plans, the deadline is normally July 31st of the following year. So that means your reporting year, say, would be 2022. Your deadline would be July 31st of 2023. So if you need an extension, there's a process you have to go through. Um, now, just at the outset, know that an extension is typically granted automatically, but you have to follow the formalities of requesting it to make sure that you request it properly. Um, so the request is going to be, um, you're going to complete and submit a form, IRS form 5558-5558, and it has to be submitted on or before the original due date of the form 5500. So this is going to give you an extension of two and a half months of the deadline. If the 5558 is properly prepared, as I mentioned before, and timely and appropriately filed, then you're going to automatically get an extension. Now, keep in mind that you're not going to get any kind of a specific authorization back from the DOL or the IRS, so you're just going to have to assume that it was granted unless you hear otherwise. Um, now, one other caveat here is that it has to be submitted in a paper form rather than an electronic format. The, 55, the 5558 is submitted for filing with the IRS and not the DOL also. So unlike your other forms, this is going to go to the IRS. So just remember, it has to be in a paper format. Uh, two and a half months um, of an extension will be granted, and it's automatically available. Um, the form election. So you have to indicate on your form that you're requesting or that you're filing an extension. Um, so you're just in box D, you check uh, the form 5558 extension box. So if a plan properly requested a 5500 extension of its calendar year by or before July 31st, it would have until October 15th to file its 5,500, so that's your two and a half months. All right, there's some other reasons you might want to have particularized filings. Um, and we just refer to these as special circumstances or special filing circumstances. So section B of the form 5,500 provides a space where you can, where you can notify the agencies of uh, these different special circumstances occurring. So the first one is a short plan year. So if your plan runs for less than 12 months, then you notify the agencies that it's a short plan year. This happens a lot when you go through a merger acquisition and the plans are acquired or the operations are acquired by a new, uh, new employer and they'll, short, they'll file a short plan year to terminate the old plan. Um, so you just, in, in um, section B, you select a short plan year report, less than 12 months, you just check that box. If your plan is terminating, if a plan is terminating at year end or during the year, indicate that the filing is going to be the last filing that, the, that the, the agencies are going to receive for that plan. So it makes sense why the agencies would need this because they have some things on their side to do also for a terminating. Amended filings. So if a prior form 5500 filing submission is amended for corrections, then you would just select the amended return or report box. And then finally, a newly adopted plan. So if a plan commences coverage within the plan year, indicate that the filing submission is for a newly adopted plan, Otherwise, agencies would have no way of knowing if you just hadn't filed prior years or if it was less than 100 in prior years or whatever, they wouldn't really know. If you select this, the first return report, they know it's a newly adopted. 
all right, what if my plan drops below the 100 employee threshold? So as Caitlin mentioned earlier, if you have less than 100 employees, uh, less than 100 employees that you're reporting, you don't have to file a 5500. Um, if, and if you fall below 100 during the year, you don't have to file for the, for the following year. So it's gotta be coded correctly with a 4R. So you're gonna put a 4R to signal a break in filing submissions for the plan. This is indicated on page two, line 8B. That's line 8B, boy, of the filing submission. Then there's also this 80-20 rule. So the 80-20 rule allows organizations to file their Form 5500 in the same category that they filed it in for the previous year. This is really, really essential for a growing business because it means that if an audit is required, then they wouldn't have to submit that. Order. They wouldn't have to focus on the audit until the following year after that, allowing the organization to concentrate on its growth instead of an audit. So how do I electronically file? So once I've got my 5500 ready and I want to file it, how do I do that? There's two different methodologies. The first one is EFAS2. So all four 5500s, including schedules and attachments, are required to be filed electronically. You have to file electronically. You can't file this paper, even though the 5558 is a paper return, paper filing for the extension. And you can do it through the EFAS2 electronic filing system. So um, under EFAS2, plan filers may choose to use either approved third-party vendor software or the DOL's web-based filing system, which is iFile, to prepare and submit their 5500 or the 5500 SF. Plan filers must also obtain EFAS2 electronic credentials to sign and or submit the 4500 or to prepare a return in iFile. Plan filers can get assistance if you call the EFAS2 helpline, and there's the number there. Now, keep in mind that when you submit all of this, you have to maintain your paper records because you have to have actual signatures on these forms. And there's no way to transmit an actual signature to the agency. So for archival purposes and for your burden of proof, make sure that you're retaining all of your paper copies with the final signatures on them, even though you are going to electronically file. And then this slide just talks a little about the iFile system. So the iFile is an alternative to EFAS2 iFile is actually the government's own uh, software package, uh, software platform. Um, it's free as well. Uh, you may have to pay for EFAS2 depending on who is preparing and submitting your return. iFile is free. Um, and all you have to do is register and have internet access. Um, iFile allows you to save and print filings as you, as you work on them. So if you can't finish it all in one setting, you can come back to it. And then returns and reports created using iFile can include a form 5500 series, the schedules and attachments. Uh, and we put a link in here to the landing page for iFile. All right, now the next piece of this is the summary annual report. The summary annual report is the participant disclosure side of the 5500. The 5500 goes to the, age, the federal agencies, uh, but is not necessarily distributed to plan participants. Now, if a plan, if a plan participant specifically asks for a 4500 for a particular year or a range of years, they are generally entitled to receive that if they request in writing or if they have a denied claim that they're appealing. Um, so keep that in mind. The SAR, the summary annual report, is going to be automatically distributed to participants and certain beneficiaries. So this is going to be an annual, annual statement that basically summarizes the most recent Form 5500. It's going to have information such as funding and insurance information, your basic financial information for the plan, rights to additional information if a participant or beneficiary has questions. And this can be an offer of assistance in a non-English language for speakers of other languages other than English. It's got to be furnished to participants under the covered plan to other individuals, such as COBRA qualifying beneficiaries. And you're actually going to distribute the SAR two months following the close of the period for which your extension was granted if you get an extension. Otherwise, it's nine months after the close of the plan year. So nine months after the close of the, of the plan year that you're reporting here. Okay, next slide. Now, electronic dissemination. If you want to distribute your SAR via electronic means to your participants, you have to follow the electronic dissemination safe harbor from the DOL. It is, it is a little antiquated, I'll be honest with you. Um, they have revisited two years in a row now amending this and still haven't done it. I think it's coming. But for right now, you got to follow these particularities. For the general requirements, the plan administrator must ensure actual delivery. So that is, um, you have to get a return receipt and you have to get undeliverable mail notices for the ones that could not be delivered. Electronic materials must meet requirements. So that means you have to have security and privacy in place. You have to be up to, up to, up to speed on HIPAA and on the um, confidentiality requirements of state law to make sure that you don't violate 
any of those laws or HIPAA in distributing these materials. You also have to have the right hardware and software infrastructure to submit this to make sure that it's encrypted, uh, front end and back end encryption and, uh, and all those other pieces that are required for stability and security in electronic communications. You have to provide a notice outlining the importance of the document, which is gonna be provided at the time of electronic delivery so that your workers do not immediately delete the communication, which is generally what happens. So you wanna provide them a notice along with that dissemination that says, hey, this is your SAR, it's really important and this is why. Paper version must be available free upon request and you have to ensure confidentiality of personal information. So those are your general system requirements. Then you have some specific requirements. You have to be able to, the, that worker that you're gonna email that electronically to has to have the ability to access and print documents where individual performs their duties. So they actually have to be able to print from their workstation or from a kiosk that it's part of their, that they can get that document and print it out. They can review it and print it at work. Um, the electronic system must be an, in an integral part of their job. So consider an office work site versus a manufacturing facility. What a lot of manufacturing facilities tried to do for a while was just set up a kiosk where all the employees could go there, they could review and download and print, and the Department of Labor said that's not really that's not really satisfying the safe harbor. To satisfy the safe harbor, that employee has to have a desktop or a laptop where they can access this stuff because the ability to do the computing work or the online access or the email access is an integral part of their job. So what happens a lot of times when people are trying to when employers are trying to satisfy this safe harbor is that they end up having to do a dual dissemination. They're going to do some of their disseminations in paper for like a manufacturer. Uh, manufacturing employee, and then an office employee may get theirs electronically. But you may, uh, in approaching this, just keep in mind, you may have a bifurcated approach. All right, so our last section here is part four. Now we're gonna talk about correcting 450-500s. If you missed a filing, how to correct that. And then we'll talk a little bit about penalties associated with non-filing or non-dissemination of your SAR. So 450-500 submissions can be uh, may be filed to correct any previously filed Form 5500 errors. Now, this is important because if you file a, a, an amended filing prior to the IRS contacting you about an error, then they won't penalize you for the error. To floor, so you can file the amended return or report basically without, without penalty, uh, which is great. So if you uncover an error in a previously filed 5500, go ahead and correct it. There's not a charge for it. And in worst case scenario, you get out of a penalty from the IRS. So in part one of the annual report, um, you'll see under section B, you can check there that it's an amended return or report. This is the same section that we talked about earlier, or the other section that it has, if you're, if you're filing your first return or report or your final return or report, if you're filing for a short plan year. So what are the penalties for not complying with the Form 5500 submission requirement? These can be really significant. So you want to be careful. They add up quickly. The DOL and the IRS can both cooperatively or independently assess penalties for noncompliance. So that would be things like submitting incomplete or inaccurate Form 5500s, failure to file at all by the applicable due dates, and others. The DOL has the authority under ERISA to assess penalties of up to $2,400 per day. And that is adjusted annually. So it tends to go up every year for each day an administrator fails or refuses to file a complete Form 5500. Um, that would also be a, a duty to file an accurate one as well. Penalties may be mitigated upon reasonable cause. So if you were like, say in the middle of a merger or some other organizational transaction, you might be filing late or something like that, and you would be relieved of any penalty if you were, if you were doing that, if there were special circumstances. The IRS can also impose civil penalties for noncompliance. So a civil penalty um, would be in addition to a criminal penalty for a willful violation. The DOL typically sends a notice of intent to assess a penalty to a filer uh, if there is a proposed DOL penalty. And that, um, C, that's a CP283 notice. And that's going to come, as I said, prior to your penalty actually being assessed. So you do have an opportunity to appeal the penalty before you receive the assessment. All right. There are no specific penalties for failure to distribute SIRs. Imply clients are often um, confused by this because there is a penalty if you don't file the 5500 but there's not a specific penalty if you don't distribute the SAR. But there are penalties though, because what happens is you actually violate your ERISA fiduciary duties. And they can be fined for that um, up to $100,000 or imprisonment for up to 10 years. So you really wanna get that summary annual report out. 
Don't think of it as voluntary. Think of it as mandatory and get it out. Make sure you get that out two months after the end of the extension or at the end of the filing season. The file can be um, the fine can be increased up to five hundred thousand dollars if it's a company on the other side rather than an individual too. A plan administrator is potentially liable also for a hundred and ten dollar a day penalty for failure to provide a an SAR to a participant if they requested in writing. A copy. All right. We also want to talk about the Delinquent Filer Voluntary Compliance Program or the DFPC program. So sponsored by the DOL, this is a program that allows you to uh, file a delinquent 5500 and you'll get a reduced penalty if you do it voluntarily rather than forcing you to do it. So you're eligible to use the DFPC program only if you make a required filing prior to being notified in writing by the DOL of a failure to file a timely report. So basically, this is the cat and mouse game. If you get it filed under the DFBC program, DFBC program prior to the IRS reaching out to you, telling you you have failed to file, then you can get a reduced penalty. Now, there is a calculator that will walk you through how to assess that penalty or how to calculate that penalty. So these are the steps. It's pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Um, you complete your 5500 for the year at issue or the most current form available. Check box D on the form. 5,500. So go to box D and check the box there that you're doing a delinquent filer, voluntary application. Step three, electronically file the delinquent form 5,500 under EFAS 2 or iFile. And then step four, use the DFC, the DFBC's online calculator to determine and pay your penalty. And we'll talk a little more about the penalty in just a moment. But you can see there under box D, under the far right, the DFBC program would be your notice to the agencies that you're filing a delinquent filing. All right, so understanding assessment of the DFVC program fees. So if you file under DFVCP, there are these very low caps, comparatively speaking to what the caps are under, under the typical filing scenario. Here is capped at 1,500 for most small plans, 4,000 for large plans, and 750 for small 501c3 plans. Those are nonprofits or not-for-profit organizations. Um, in order to get to that calculator and to utilize it, you're going to have to have some follow the following specific information. You have to know if the administrator is filing as a one participant plan. Is it a 501c3 entity? Does the organization sponsor a top hat or an apprenticeship plan? Was the plan file, filed using the 8020 rule that we talked about earlier? What's the plan number? The plan year end date, beginning of the year participant count, the date filed with EFAST or I file, and day since original filing deadline. So, how far past the deadline I actually are you? Now, you need to have all that information in order to access the, cal the calculator. You put this information into the calculator, it will put out the, uh, it will spit out the amount of your penalty, and you would just pay that for your DFVC penalty. Okay, so we've put some valuable resources in here, and we could probably have three pages, but these are just the ones that we thought were the most relevant. First one is the DOL webpage on the Form 5500 series, and it includes links, it includes links Information and informational copies of current and prior form 5500s and 5500 FSFs, schedules, instructions, and links to general reporting and complying assistance, compliance assistance. Under resource two, we have the DOL webpage dedicated to the EFAS2 electronic filing information system, including links to FAQs about EFAS2 and EFAS2 user guides. Under resource three, we've got DOL FAQs about the Delinquent Filer Voluntary Compliance Program or the DFVCP. Under four, we've got the DOL Form 5500 and Form 5500 SF filing tips. That's under the um, under the DOL's website right there. And then under the IRS, the last one is the IRS's Form 5500 corner. Now remember that 5500s are that obligation is duly enforced and administered by the DOL, uh, duly as in two uh, by the DOL and the IRS. So most of your resources are going to be with the DOL, but the IRS has resources also and they can hold you with a penalty for failure to file. All right, so that brings us to our question and answer session. I'm gonna pass this back over to Marie. I know our session was a little shorter today. We didn't have quite as much content to, um, to present. So it's a little bit shorter. We typically run an hour, uh, but you'll still get the full hour of credit if you stick around through the Q and A. Marie? Thank you, Jason. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Um, in the event that your question wasn't answered, uh, we will do our best to answer the question after uh, the session has ended. But this so far is all the questions we have. Um, first question, am I required to file a Form 5500 
if the employee benefit plan was terminated during the prior year? Um, so I can take this question. Uh, yes, a final plan filing is always required. Typically, you will file for um, your last year, and then there'll be a separate final filing will, where you'll zero out all the information. You cannot um, check mark the final filing if there are assets left at the end of the year, if there's participants left at the end of the year. So usually it's comprised of two separate filings, the one filing for the plan year, and then a separate final filing where you indicate um, there's no benefits, no participants, and it's essentially just zero all the way down. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, what is my employee benefit plans number? Jason, I think hey, that question. Would you like me to take that one? Yeah. Sure. Sure. All right. Uh, so the plan number is, is designated by the employer, and it's going to be the designation for your plan when you file under Form 5500. That plan number has also got to be on your SPD and your other participant disclosures that talk about the plan. Um, it's assigned by the employer, as I mentioned before. It generally starts with the 501. So 501 in that case would be your wrap plan. And then if you had any other plans, they would be 502, 503, 504, and you just kind of go into session. Now, remember that if you use a number and then you terminate that plan and you sponsor a new plan, you can't use the old number. You should keep using new numbers as you adopt new plans. Okay. And last question, who do I contact if I have questions about completing Form 5500? Um, I can take this one. So um, we provided several resources on the previous slide as to, um, there's also the DOL's EBSA, which is the Employee Benefits Security Administration. I've called this number various times. They're very helpful. They can confirm things that aren't necessarily clear in the instructions. Um, you can also ask your tax advisor, but definitely uh, we have several resources there and lots of information. You can ask your service team. And if it's general information, we can absolutely help out with that. Okay, thank you. Um, just as a reminder for anybody looking to get credit for today's session, here's the information that you need for that. Um, but for anybody looking for today's slides or recording, we will be sharing uh, the recording out at uh, after this has all been wrapped up. Um, so if you had questions, we will do our best to answer those um, if they came, came in after the Q&A session. But as a reminder, we have our National Regulatory Compliance Team here to help you. Um, and if you have any questions, comments, or need additional information, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, thank you so much for your time and attention today, and have a great rest of your day.